All right, so uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, homomorphic signatures and uh, as a bonus also about homomorphic commitments. Uh, this is based on a joint work with Sergey and Vinod, but I'm going to present things a little differently here than they are in the paper. So first of all, I'm going to focus on this notion of homomorphic commitments as a good way of really understanding what's going on in the signature scheme. And also I'll focus much more on the techniques and the mathematical tools, like it's the mathematics of crypto workshop. So I'll focus on that rather than the actual end result. I won't even define homomorphic signatures uh, until about midway through the talk. And the reason is that I think these tools are actually more, even more important than the application, I think there should be more uses of them. So that's what I really want to convey. Okay, so uh, let's start with the GSW, the Gentry Sahai Waters um, uh, FHE schemes. And uh, so this is the one that Tsika presented to you. And here's just a cheat sheet, what you need to remember from Tsika's talk. So uh, the public key is some matrix A. It's an LWE matrix. So the last row is a close to a linear combination of the previous rows. And the secret key is just the LWE secret, the coefficients of this linear co combination. And this is the encryption. So to encrypt uh, uh, a bit X, I'm just going to take the ciphertext to be A times R plus XG, where R is a random matrix with small entries. So in Zika stocks, it was a zero one matrix. Um, that's not actually essential that just zeros ones. It could be some small Gaussian and everything would work just fine and that'll be useful for us later, but it just needs to have small entries. And G is the, this gadget matrix, the powers of two matrix that uh, Zika showed you. So this is how to encrypt. And I want to now recast the scheme as a commitment scheme. So if you see nothing much changed on the slide, except I got rid of the secret key and I changed the names of the procedures. So now imagine that someone comes, generates a public key for the GSW scheme, but then immediately deletes the secret key. This is a trusted third party. We all trust that they did it correctly and just publishes the public key. So now there's a public key, there's no secret key. Well, what's the point of that? It's useful as a commitment. What's a commitment? Let's have some value, like I can predict the outcome of the next Super Bowl. So, uh, but I don't want anyone to know, you know what the outcome is. It'll make life boring, but I want people to eventually find out that I have this amazing predictive power. So I'm going to take uh, this value. I'm going to essentially encrypt it. I'm going to call that committing to it. No one has the secret key, so no one can decrypt it. But I'm going to remember the randomness. So the randomness of the encryption R. And later, after the Super Bowl happens, I want to convince everyone that you know I predicted things correctly. So I'm going to give people this value R and the, the bit X that I committed to. And people can uh, compute, you know, check that this the commitment was computed correctly. And then they know that the value that I committed to was indeed the value X. OK? So uh, this scheme ha is statistically binding. Uh, if I give you this commitment, uh, the value x is uniquely determined statistically. And that just follows from the correctness of the GSW encryption schemes. If someone actually had the secret key, they could decrypt it. So there's a unique value contained in the ciphertext. Of course, no one has the secret key. No one can get it. And uh, therefore, the scheme is also computationally hiding. So if you just get the commitment, you don't learn anything about the, the value x. And that follows from the security of GSW. Actually, moreover, the scheme is even extractable if you had a trapdoor. So if this person, this trusted third party, didn't delete the secret key, then they could even extract out the commitments. There's a trapdoor that lets you extract, but hopefully no one has it, right? That's why we want uh, binding and, and hiding. OK, there's many ways to do commitments, even from one-way functions. Why would we use this? Well, there's a nice property that this has, which is that it's homomorphic. It has some homomorphic properties. And uh, we can uh, take a bunch of commitments, so commitments to different values, x1, x2, and so on, using the same public key A. And we can take the openings to these commitments, and we can do homomorphic computations on these. Okay, so uh, maybe as a scenario, let's say I didn't just predict the outcome of the next Super Bowl. I predicted like all the scores of all the games in the next season. And then um, I want to convince someone that the values I committed to, I actually got correctly, let's say, the median score of a game. Okay, so I want, I want to convince someone that I, com I predicted the median score of a game in the season correctly. So people can do a computation, can do a computation on the commitments and compute a commitment that's a commitment to the median score. So you evaluate this median function. I can compute some operation on the openings and come up with a small opening that convinces you that this is correct. So there's two homomorphic evaluation procedure here. One procedure that works on the commitments. This is exactly the GSW homomorphic operations we saw that Svika presented. This is doing 
homomorphic operations on. Previously, these commitments were called ciphertext. So this is the homomorphic operation on the ciphertext. But there's another homomorphic operation, which is the homomorphic operation on the openings. So I can take the openings, the randomness here, and do some operation on that and come up with an opening that opens this commitment to the right value, f of x1 up to xn, where f can be, again, any function. And that just amounts to keeping track of what's happening with the randomness of encryption as you're doing homomorphic operations. And we can do that. In the GSW scheme, we can keep track of the randomness. So, uh, uh, OK, and this is the property that I want to preserve. So if you do the homomorphic computation on the commitments and the openings, you get the right value. You get the right opening to the homomorphically computed commit. Why GSW? What about other homomorphic encryption schemes? Uh, I think most of them have it. I'm not sure if you do things like bootstrapping, you might lose it, actually. But uh, mo most have it. We'll see why GSW in a little bit. There's some extra properties that has that are useful. Uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, not, not really. So um, I don't know that these commitments, that anyone can open the initial commitments. So it, it gives you some sort of binding on the homomorphic value commitment. You can only open it one way. But I don't actually know that, it's, that there's actually any bits that you committed to that uh, in the beginning. So uh, as in, I might not have committed to actual scores of the games uh, like, like in, in the season. But if you compute the median, you know that there's only one value contained there, right, if you do the homomorphic computation. So it's not useful for proofs of knowledge, unfortunately. OK. Um, so one more thing I want to say is um, what we're concerned about here is that everything is short, succinctness. So this evaluated commitment is short, the evaluated opening is short. There's another property you might want, which is that when I open the commitment to this homomorphic computation, I don't reveal anything else about the values that I committed to other than the value of this function. We're not going to worry about that. We're not, the, the scheme I'm going to present will not have that property. We can add it. Uh, okay, so we can, we, we can add this extra property that you have privacy, but that's not going to be the focus. So just the main focus is that everything is short. The homomorphic commitment is short. The homomorphic opening is short. OK, so let's see how to do this. Uh, this is just the GSW operation. So uh, let's say we want to compute addition. Well, we're just going to add the two commitments. It's the adding two ciphertexts. And uh, if you want to operate on the openings, you're just going to add the bits and add the randomness. And this is the equation you have, right? So, uh, uh, so this commitment C plus, the correct opening for it is indeed just the sum of the two, two randomnesses. The randomness just adds up. Okay, so that, that's really easy. Multiplication is a little bit harder. So this was the uh, homomorphic operation on the ciphertext that Tsika showed you. So to create a product, to create a, a homomorphic evaluation of the product, you just do C1 times G inverse of C2. What happens to randomness here is a little more complicated. This is the new randomness you get in green. And uh, well, you can check out that it works. It's this complicated equation. But what's really happening here is that I'm opening C1 as AR1 plus X1G. I'm multiplying that by G inverse C2. Well, G inverse C2 is just some short value. So I'm going to group R1 and G inverse C2 together. Then I get X1G times G inverse of C2. The G and G inverse cancel. So I get X1C2. I'm now writing C2 as AR2 plus X2G. And now, again, I'm going to group x1, r2 together. Those are both short values, and I get this thing. So I get, uh, if I'm grouping all the short values together, I'm going to get this plus what I wanted. This is the commitment to x1, x2. So again, we're just keeping track of what's happening with the randomness as we're doing GSW operations. OK. So we have this commitment scheme that has these nice homomorphic properties. And actually, I want to tell you that this commitment comes in two different flavors. There's two flavors of this commitment, depending on how the public key is chosen. So the way that the public key is chosen in GSW, the way that Suika showed you, it has this structure. So A is an LWE matrix. So the first few rows are random. I'm going to write it as B. And the last row is just uh, uh, an LWE sample. It's a close to a linear combination of the previous rows. And so that's how we chose uh, the public key A in the GSW scheme. What does that give you? Well, uh, it gives you statistical binding just because, you know, correctness of decryption. If someone actually had the decryption key, they could decrypt. And it gives you computational hiding by the LW assumption. That's just the security of GSW. 
But there's another way we could have chosen the public key. We could have just chosen it uniformly at random. Okay, now there is no secret key. What do you get then? Oh, sorry, one more thing. And it's even extractable using the trapdoor. So if you have S, you can actually extract uh, X from the commitment. Okay, so what if we had chosen A uniformly at random? What happens then? Well, it turns out that now the scheme is actually statistically hiding. A commitment, no matter what bid you commit to, the commitment is just a random value. Why is that? Well, A times R is uh, just a, a leftover hash lemma extractor. So this is just a, A times R is statistically close to uniformly random. Okay, so it's statistically hiding. And uh, it turns out to also be computationally binding. There's two ways to show that. So one way is you can show it based on the sys problem, the short integer solution problem, directly show that that implies it's computationally binding. But you haven't heard what the sys problem is. You heard about LWE. So there's an easier way, or a really easy way to show, see from LWE, which is, well, I could have chosen the matrix this way. You wouldn't have been able to see the difference. And here it would have been statistically binding. So it must be the case that here it's computationally binding. And that's actually exactly how you uh, prove computationally hiding here. You say, oh, I could have chosen this, the public key this way, and then it would have been statistically hiding. So right? So, yeah. <laughs> so who is actually picking A, and what happens if they lie? Uh, if, if they lie, things are really bad. They, uh, so if they choose it this way, they can extract commitments. They can actually find out what you're committing to. OK. Uh, if they choose it this way, there's another bad thing. They can lie. They can open commitments multiple ways. So it turns out that if you choose it this way, it's equivocal. Uh, you can actually equivocate on a commitment. You can open it multiple ways if you have a trapdoor. And that's what I'm going to show you next. But just to answer Russell's question, so it's very important that here, whoever chooses the commitment key, this A, is doing it honestly and doesn't have any trapdoors. So you know, chooses A randomly or, or this way, doesn't matter which way, but then goes away. OK? So, um, so that's the next thing I want to show you, that actually if you choose it randomly, then there's a trap door. You can choose the A with a trap door that lets you equivocate, that lets you open a commitment multiple ways. Okay, and this is something called uh, related to the short integer solution trap door, which was something uh, introduced by ITI. Uh, there's a lot of variants of that. I'm going to present one that's closer to something done by Michancha Pikert. And so the, here, the goal is to choose a, matri a random matrix A, statistically close to random, with some trap door such that for any matrix V, we can solve, we can find a short R such that AR is equal to V. Why? Uh, so here, I'm not going to be too, too worried about dimensions, but V sort of the, the height of V is the same as the height of R. How uh, fat it is doesn't matter. You could just have one vector then you can just repeat it for each vector of v. But uh, so I'm claiming that if you can uh, meet this goal, you can equivocate on commitments. Why? So to open any commitment c, anyone you want, to any bit x, I'm just going to set v to be c minus xg. Then I'm going to solve for r. And then I get ar plus xg equals c, which means I open c as a commitment of x. <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, this is the goal. This is the trap I want. And here's the way to get it. So I'm going to choose a yet another way, not exactly randomly, not exactly as LWE, but this way. So I'm going to choose the first m over 2 columns of a uniformly random. And then the last of m over 2 columns, I'm going to choose as b r star plus g, where r star is some short, maybe 0, 1 matrix, short randomness. And again, uh, because of leftover hash lemma, this is statistically close to uniform. So this is statistically close to uniform matrix altogether. Okay, and my trap door here is going to be the, the knowledge of this, this randomness R star. In fact, it's useful to think of it as this matrix negative R star and identity. And if I write it that way, uh, the trap door this way, then A times T is equal to G. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm claiming I can solve this problem just uh, when I get V, I'm just going to set R to be T times G inverse of V. What happens if I take A times R, I get AT, which is G times G inverse of V. I just get V. Okay, so this lets me, lets me solve that problem. Let's me solve the sys problem. So this is a way I can equivocate any commitment at all to any bit I want. But this is actually not quite what I want. This is too weak. When I do this, the randomness R I come up with, I do, I do find some opening of the commitment, but it doesn't look legitimate. It's not the right distribution. I mean, I, I managed to open it, 
but it, it'll look fishy. It's not going to look like someone who actually generated the commitment the right way. So I actually want to also match the distributions. That turns out to be a slightly harder problem. So here we want to do uh, some sort of a trapdoor opening from the correct distribution. And let me phrase it this way. So the stronger goal is I want to choose a random matrix A with a trapdoor such that the following two distributions will be statistically close. Either I'm going to choose R, the randomness R, from some short distribution, maybe some Gaussian or, or zero 01, random zero 01, but some distribution over short entry matrices, and I'm going to compute V equals AR, versus choosing V uniformly at random, and then somehow opening R using the trapdoor. I want to make sure that these two distributions are statistically uh, indistinguishable or, or close. Um, and this should be the case, actually, even if you're given the trapdoor. So I want the randomness to come from the, from the opening procedure itself. Okay, um, so, um, uh, so this is something that I'm not going to show you how to do it. It's something that was first done by this work of uh, Gentry Pikert and Michael Tanathan. Uh, there's, uh, other ways, there's a couple of different ways to do it. And most of the work's actually do it by carefully analyzing discrete Gaussian distributions. It really relies on concrete property of discrete Gaussians. Uh, there's a different way to do it, uh, which uh, we did in this work with Vadim, where we do it via rejection sampling. And I think the parameters are all worse in pretty much all respects, but it's conceptually simpler. You don't need to know about Gaussians, so that's one reason I actually like it. OK, so this is something I'm not going to show you, but it's something we can do. And how does it l relate to the commitments? So now, uh, in, the, in the language of commitments, these two distributions should be indistinguishable, either actually taking uh, this randomness R from some specified distribution, discrete Gaussian or something specific, and computing the commitment correctly as a commitment to bit, uh, to bit x, versus just choosing a uniformly random commitment and then equivocating it using the trapdoor to bit x. You shouldn't be able to. These should be indistinguishable. You can't tell which one I'm doing. So the distributions are matching. OK, so we, ha we have this. Statistically, Statistically yeah. OK, so uh, that's what homomorphic commitments are. So just a brief summary of the homomorphic commitments. This is uh, we have a way of committing to a bit using some randomness. The opening is the randomness. We can hom homomorphically evaluate any function on the commitments and the openings. These are two different homomorphic procedures. Things match up. We have two flavors of these, extractable versus equivocal. And depending on how you choose the commitment key, you can get one version, you can get one flavor or the other, and they are indistinguishable. And in the equivocal mode, we can open a commitment using a trapdoor. We can open a commitment to any bid we want, and the distributions match up. So this is what you should remember. Now I'm going to use this as a tool to build signatures to build something new. Okay. In fact, I want to sort of say that uh, this idea of commitments explains both homomorphic encryptions and homomorphic signature. If you have the extractable version, what does extractable mean? There's a trapdoor that lets you, lets you decrypt. That's encryption, right? That's fully homomorphic encryption. And it turns out that in the equivocal mode, you will get signatures. And actually, there's a really nice property here that this commitment can be set up in one mode or the other. You can't tell the difference. They're indistinguishable. I don't have any application of that. So uh, if you have any ideas, I think that should have some applications. But right now, we have application of one mode and the other mode, but now that you have one commitment that can work in either. OK, so let me now move to homomorphic signatures. And uh, let's do the motivation. So here we have some user, Alice. Uh, she has some data x. Think of it as a big database. She wants to outsource this data to some cloud server. Okay, she's going to store X on the cloud. And later, either Alice or maybe some uh, other user, Bob, wants the server to compute some function over this data, some function F over this data, and uh, give the output Y. Okay, so that's the, that's the whole problem. And, uh, you know, there's two things you might be worried about. One is privacy. Does the server learn X? And if you want to solve the privacy per, per, uh, problem, you can use fully homomorphic encryption. That's what Zika spoke about. The other problem is verifiability. Is the answer you're getting correct? That's what we're going to be concerned about here. So uh, again, uh, we can look at this problem in two settings. One would be, let's say that the server wasn't computing a function. Let's say it was just a channel. You were just sending X from Alice to Bob. So I call that communication. There's two problems, privacy and verifiability. So privacy, you know, use encryption if you want to solve privacy. 
if you want to go in the setting where the service actually didn't com uh, computation, well, you need homomorphic encryption. Okay, let's look at verifiability. If you just want uh, communication, you need signatures, right? That'll solve the, just the, that problem. Now, if you want to do computation, well, let's just combine the terms. We need some sort of homomorphic signatures. So that's what homomorphic signatures are. Let me be a little more specific, okay? So in homomorphic signature scheme, the Alice is going to have some secret key SK. Everyone knows her verification key, I'll call that PK. So Bob and everyone knows that, the server too. And uh, Alice is going to sign some, I think of it as a big data set X using the scheme. She's going to come up with some signature sigma, and she's going to give the server the data X and the signature sigma. Now the server can choose any function F we want, or Bob can choose it, anyone can choose, F can come sort of from the sky, and the server can uh, compute this function F of X, and also homomorphically evaluate this function over the data and the signature. So in this case, the data is in the clear, the server knows X. He's computing the function over the data and the signature. He's going to come up with something, uh, this value sigma fy. I'll call that a certificate that certifies that y is the output of the function f computed on Alice's data. Okay. So Bob is going to get the, func the output y of this, of this computation and the signature He's, and the certificate. This isn't just a signature of y. It's not like uh, this actually says that y, y, it certifies y as out of the blue. It certifies that y is the output of a, of a particular function f applied to Alice's data. Bob doesn't know Alice's data uh, at this point, but he'll be sure that y is the output of the function applied on whatever data she signed. Okay? Um, and the main property that we want in this talk, again, will be just compactness. So uh, everything should be small. In particular, this, sig this certificate should be of some size which is independent of the size of uh, Alice's data or the complexity of the computation. So a trivial solution to this would be just to sign Alice's data with a normal signature scheme, then give all of Alice's data and the signatures to Bob, and Bob can do the computation himself. That's not what we want. We want things to be short. Okay, and so Bob is going to want to verify whether uh, this output y is actually the, the output of the function f on Alice's data x. This verification procedure will actually consist of two steps. So one step is that Bob will do some pre-processing or processing on the function f and just the public key. And he'll get something I'll call just a function-specific public key for this function f. And this step will be computation expensive. It'll actually, uh, in our scheme, ideally it wouldn't be, but in our scheme this will take as much time as computing f. So Bob is not start saving on computation, just on this communication. But the second step, uh, which will be uh, specific to the actual output and the data, will be to verify uh, that y is correct. Uh, you're just going to take this preprocessed public key, the output y, and the certificate, and this step uh, will be efficient. It's independent of the, of the runtime of the computation, um, uh, or of the runtime of f, or the size of x. Okay, so we are getting some efficiency here, but you always have to preprocess any function you want to verify. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you need preprocessing. And PKF has to be short, right? PKF is short, yeah, yeah. But you do get this delegation in the earlier papers, right, this preprocessing. Uh, it's coming. I think next slide will be comparing to other work. So yeah, if, if you. So um, OK. So and the security here is that if, if f of x is equal to y, the cloud cannot convince Bob of any other output y prime. So you cannot give a certificate uh, that verifies for some y prime, which is not f of x. That's the security. There's some additional features you could ask for uh, that are mostly, I'm just going to mention them here. I won't discuss them much more. But uh, for example, here, Alice, in this scenario, Alice just signs one data set x, one database. You could ask that she signs many different databases, right? And maybe she has like a data set of her employer, uh, employee salaries and uh, some other information about her company. And she, you know, she signs different ones at different times. So we can do that as well. Uh, at that point, Alice has to just, each time she signs a data set, she has to give it some label. And when you verify computation, you need to know which data set this computation is supposed to be evaluated on. So you need to have that label in mind when you're verifying. Another feature you might want is context hiding, some sort of privacy feature, which is that if you get the certificate that Y is the output of, of this computation analysis data, you shouldn't learn anything else about Alice's data other than the output Y. 
So it should preserve some privacy. And uh, again, that's something that we can do, but I'm not going to, not going to talk about it. Okay. Um, so um, the idea of homomorphic signatures has been around for a while. Uh, and uh, most of the past works on homomorphic signatures looked at the case of linear functions. So they were able to just do, you know, you had some coefficients and you were able to do like an inner product of Alice's data x with some vector of, of your knowledge. Uh, and so the good news is we know how to do that from nice assumptions like uh, bilinear assumptions, RSA, short integer solution and lattices. If we wanted to go beyond that, there was this really beautiful work by Bonin Freeman that showed how to do bounded degree polynomials, so really constant degree polynomials. And this was based on the ideal short integer solution problem, so a lattice problem and the random Oracle model. Uh, there's another work by Catalano, uh, I think Fiore and Varinci, which did it for also bounded degree polynomials but got rid of the random Oracle at the cost of using multilinear maps. And so in this talk, I'm going to show you how to do all circuits. It's going to be a leveled scheme, so the sizes do grow with the depth of the circuit, but nothing else. And uh, we're going to do it just based on the short integer solution problem or the LW problem. Actually, we're going to do it black box using homomorphic commitments that are equivocable. The other, the other results, uh, they have to uh, invest so much time in the computation? Like, yeah, all, all of these yeah, results. So, uh, everyone's, they're all in, on equal footing, yeah. About snark solution. Uh, I think that's the next 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 slide. Yeah. So there are other solutions to this problem, uh, like you've also pointing out, other things you can do. So one is uh, CS proofs of snarks that were defined by Mikali. Um, so this is a way to take any complicated NP statement and give a very short proof that proves it. And if you have that, you c there's a very nice simple solution to this problem. So Alice is just going to sign her data with a classical signature. And then the server, if he wants to convince Bob that y is equal to f of x, uh, that f of x is equal to y for, this, for the data x that Alice signed, he's just going to create uh, this uh, CS proof or snark that certifies this. So it's an NP statement. There exists uh, some data x and some standard signatures such that f of x is equal to y. That's what he's going, he's going to give a short proof of that to Bob. And Bob is just going to verify the proof. Okay, so here you actually need uh, succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. It's a pretty strong assumption. So uh, it uses non-standard assumptions like random Oracle model um, or knowledge of exponent type assumptions. And in fact, these are, these are essential. There's some uh, evidence that you cannot do it without, without these types of strong assumptions. In fact, for the here you actually need arguments of knowledge. There's evidence that these might not even exist in the most general case. So you need some very targeted assumption in order to clear the, the negative results. There's also been a lot of works, uh, and so that's the, that's the part that we're going to get rid of in this work. We're going to do things just from LWE or SIS. There's also been a lot of works on memory delegation, which is another, another uh, uh, way of do solving this problem. And there you can actually even sometimes get rid of the pre-processing and get uh, efficient solutions where Bob never works as hard as evaluating the program. The main difference is that all of these solutions require some interaction. There's some challenge response protocol that Bob has run with the server, whereas we're talking about a completely non-interactive solution, uh, solution. There's really a fixed certificate that certifies the output of the computation. So, um, so that, that's the main difference there. Okay, so the theorem is that there exists a homomorphic signature scheme for arbitrary uh, programs. You're gonna represent them as circuit where um, the size of the certificate is going to grow with the depth of the circuit and the security parameter, but not with the size of the circuit or the size of the data. And uh, the security would be just assuming the short integer solution or LWE problem. In fact, uh, equivocal homomorphic commitments. There's a caveat. Um, we're going to need to assume that all parties have access to a very large public random string as large as the size of the data that Alice is signing. Okay? Uh, in the Oracle model, random Oracle model, you can get rid of it. Maybe you can just pretend that the digits of pi are good enough or sunspots or something like that, but that is a caveat here. So the random string, is it reusable? I mean, let's say Alice is using it. Completely reusable. Everyone uses the same one. I see. Yeah. So it's just, this, the it's just, just random it's bits in the sky. The data to be exactly, there. yeah. You need that for correctness? Uh, well, for correctness, you can use pi rather than a random string. For security, you need it to be actually random. Can a malicious generator um, do bad things? 
Yes. Yes. If the string is generating maliciously, bad things can happen. OK. So as a warm up, let's just do something really pathetic. I want, yeah? So the verifier does not have to read this public string, right? The verifier does have to read the public string. It does? Yeah. Yeah, and so remember there's that pre-processing stage that does take as long as the data. So he needs to do it during the pre-processing stage. Daniel, is there any, in terms of the caveats of pre-processing and the large random string, is there any evidence that these are inherent? So the pre-processing is inherent if you're doing it at the level of circuits rather than Turing machines, because just reading the compute circuit takes as much time as evaluating it. Is there any evidence that you need either the random string or the No. No. Uh, not, not as far as I know. Um, OK. So, um, so let, uh, as a warm up, let's do something really pathetic, uh, really simple. Just a one time, one bit signature from an equivocal commitment. OK, I think this is, uh, this is well known, but uh, I don't have a good reference. So someone please tell me if you know what the, what the right reference is. So here the public parameters are just going to be a, a random commitment, not to any bit, just totally random. Cho choose it from the space of commitments at random. The verification key is going to be the commitment key. So, um, and the signing key is the, going to be the equivocation trapdoor. Okay. And uh, to sign a message X, we're just going to use, the signer is going to use the trapdoor to sample an opening to this commitment that opens it as a commitment to X. Okay, that's it. That allows you, here you're just signing one bit, you can only do it one time, that's it. Okay, and uh, this scheme has some nice selective security. Well, in the case of one bit, it doesn't matter, selective, but not, but it's actually useful to think of it as selective. So if the adversary tells you what bit he's going to ask you to sign ahead of time, you can just set the commitment to be the commitment of the correct bit. So you can actually program it in the public parameters without knowing the trap door. And now if the adversary is able to forge, come up with a signature of the incorrect bit, well, you just broke the binding property of the commitment, right? You committed to one value, the adversary gave you the, uh, opened the commitment to the other value, you broke binding. That's it. Okay, and these distributions are indistinguishable by the equivocation property we have. Whether you generate the commitment just at random and then later open it using the equivocation trapdoor versus actually committing to the bit ahead of time, those are the same distributions. Okay. What if you want to do many bits? Still one time, but now many bits? Well, now I can put many random commitments in the public parameters. And uh, to sign like a, a long message x1, xn, you can just use the trapdoor to sample openings for each one of these commitments to the correct values you want to sign. So here, the public parameters grow with the number of bits you want to sign, but the public key and the verification key, the verification key and the signing key stay short. Those don't grow. Okay. And this is the main idea we're going to use to construct the fully homomorphic commitments. So the fully homomorphic commitments, we're going to have these long public parameters, which are just uh, sorry, fully homomorphic signatures. We're just going to have these long public parameters, which are commitments, to just randomly generate commitments. The verification key is the commitment key. The signing key is the equivocation trapdoor. To sign a long message x1, xn, you're just going to open each one of the commitments to the right value. And now the homomorphic operations work as follows. So um, if you want to compute uh, some homomorphic function over the signatures, that's essentially the homomorphic operation over the openings of the commitments. Signatures are openings to commitments. Okay? So you're just going to evaluate this function over the openings and get some certificate, which is just an opening RF. Uh, to, well, to, to, to some commitment, to the homomorphic value commitment. The verifier is going to run the homomorphic computation. So the signer, the, the, the evaluator runs the homomorphic, the cloud, I guess, runs the homomorphic computation on the openings. The verifier is going to run the same, the homomorphic computation on the commitment. So this pre-processing of a function f is going to run this uh, homomorphic computation over the commitments that are in the, in the public parameters and come up with the commitment, uh, to, well, for this function f, okay? And how do you actually verify then? Well, you just check that the commitment matches, that this homomorphically evaluated opening is a correct opening to the value y for this homomorphically evaluated commitment value. Okay, so you just check that the things match up. 
And uh, why is it secure? Well, you can show that this is at least selectively secure. So selectively secure if you know what data is going to be signed ahead of time. So not in the, in the actual scheme, but in the proof of security, the adversary tells you what data he'll want you to sign ahead of time. Well, if he does that, you can actually set these commitments uh, in the public parameters to be commit. Uh, so in the reduction, you can set these commitments in public parameters to be the commitments of the bits that the adversary is going to want to see signed. Then you can give him the signatures just by giving you giving this randomness to the to the adversary. If the adversary manages to come up with a function f and some forged signature, so that's an opening of this commitment cf, the homomorphic value commitment, to some value y prime, which is not the correct output of the computation. Well, you can compute the correct signature, the correct opening of that commitment to the correct value y, and now you have. Uh, 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 now you open the commitment in two different ways. So you broke the binding property of the commitment. Okay, so this shows you that this scheme already has uh, selective security. Distribution of CF is uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that, that's really the scheme. So th this gives you selective security. Um, so uh, so well they're. they're it is a one-time signature scheme. So here, Alice is just signing one data set. But different people could have totally different public keys and, and signing keys. They wouldn't interact, interfere with each other. But then the, in the proof of security, you just set CIs to be, to be equal to certain values. So you would just guess who's going to be attacked. Yeah, exactly. You just guess who's going to be attacked. So if CF is uniform, how does it depend on F? C, sorry, C, the, these commitments in the public. Oh no, CF is the homomorphic evaluation of the function F on these commitments in the pub, in the in the okay, sky. So it's, not it's not uniform. So Sorry. It cannot be open to anything. It cannot be open to anything. Um, that's right. So so I mean in the security proof I'm not opening CF to the wrong thing, right? I'm opening these original I'm well actually in the in, in the scheme is opening commitments incorrectly. The proof is creating commitments correctly. Uh, I know that's a confusing part. So the actual scheme is using that equivocation of the commitments, right? To sign you, open the commitment to whatever value you want to sign. In the proof, we're going to set the commitments correctly to actually be commitments to the value that will be signed. And we don't know the trapdoor. Nevertheless, if the adversary forges, he, gives, he breaks the binding property. So without knowing the trapdoor, we manage to break binding. That's the reduction. And that's the, the one time thing. This is just for one time. One time as in, uh, you, you only sign one data set, yeah. Uh, so let me mention a couple of extensions. So, you know, we started with something very simple. You can just sign one data set. It has selective security. So if you want full set security, not just selective, the adversary doesn't, isn't nice and doesn't tell you what, uh, what data he's going to want to see signed ahead of time, there's a nice way to go from this selective to full via a notion called chameleon hash. Um, in order to do it with homomorphic signatures, we need some sort of a homomorphic chameleon hash. And that turns out to be exactly a homomorphic equivocal commitment. So we have that. So sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend more time on that. This is just for those who know what chameleon hash actually is. Uh, if you want to sign multiple data sets, so not just one data set, there's a really easy way to do it, which is you're just going to use a standard signature scheme not a homomorphic one. Each time you want to start it, sign a new data set, you're just going to choose a totally fresh pub, uh, verification key and signing key for the homomorphic signature scheme, and then sign the verification key of the homomorphic scheme with the regular scheme. Okay, so that's just sort of a hybrid uh, signature type thing. Uh, and lastly, I, I just want to mention this context hiding property. So we want to make sure the certificate only reveals the, the result of the computation and nothing else. Well, one simple way to do it generically is just with NISIC. So instead of actually giving the homomorphically computed signature, you'll give a non-interactive zero-notch proof that you know it. So here you don't need snarks or anything, right? This is, uh, the, the statement is short. Uh, so that, that's a generic way to do it. it. Turns out that there's actually a nice way to do it for our specific scheme just using the properties of lattices. Um, so just the, the underlying algebra. You don't need any extra assumptions. Okay, uh, so some big open problems are how do you remove the large public parameters? It'd be nice to get rid of that. Can we remove the dependence of, on, on the depth of the circuit uh, or do bootstrapping? Um, we don't know how to do bootstrapping for this scheme. We know how to do it for the encryption. It doesn't quite work for the signature exactly because there's no secret key to, to encrypt. There's no decryption key. 
And uh, one more problem the guy alluded to is can you do something where there's no pre-processing, everything is efficient? I think that would require vastly different techniques because it would really, you would need to work with the idea that the computation is a Turing machine rather than a circuit. So that would really be different than what we're doing here, but it would be interesting to do that. Okay. That's it. Thank you. You already mentioned that uh, it is possible to hide uh, uh, the operations that were done uh, uh, on the uh, um, on the input. Uh, is it uh, do you get it for free, or uh, what is the cost of achieving this? Oh, oh, that's essentially, so the, this, this context hiding thing. It's not, you're not hiding the operations because the verifier needs to know what computation is supposed to be checking. You're hiding the data other than the output of the computation. Uh, and that's essentially for free, yeah. In this case. In this case, for this scheme. I mean, the scheme is already pretty inefficient, but it's, you know, you get like n not much more inefficient. Yeah. Maybe multi-key uh, uh, that's a good question. So uh, yes, we actually can. Uh, it's not in the paper, but there's actually an easy way to do it. So I'll be happy to tell you. So we'll resume at uh, 11:30. Let's thank uh, everybody.